All right. Welcome back to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. I am really excited for today's episode. Uh, get to have invite on a couple of folks that I truly consider to be uh, friends and comrades, just lovely people. Um, so we'll have Laura Shihai and Stephen Shihai. Um, they are the authors of the book you could see over my shoulder, Psychoanalysis Under Occupation, Practicing Resistance in Palestine. Uh, they both are professors with a lot of cool gigs and duties, and I'm not going to run through the whole list of those, um, but I appreciate all the work that they do, and I'm really excited to welcome them back to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism, first time on a live stream. Um, we'll say that we did do an episode I should double check, but I think it's in the show description. Um, we did an episode actually beginning of last year. It feels like much longer ago than that, but uh, but um, we talked about your book. And so if folks want to learn a little bit more about that specific book, which I think is just a it's a great book. It's, you know, really good. Um, highly recommend it. Then go check out that discussion because you'll get a lot more kind of depth into you know, the nuts and bolts of that. And here we're going to kind of, I guess, in some ways, pick up on some of the themes of that book, but also try to have a conversation about what's going on now um, and not talk about now in some isolated, decontextualized way either that we often are talking about it in, at least if folks are in the Western media, hopefully we're not doing that here at all. But, uh, you know, so anyways, Lauren, Stephen, welcome. Great to have you back. Thanks for having me. So good to have over. you, Cameron. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, so, you know, before we get into the questions, I just wanted to give both of you space if there's anything that you would like to say at the outset of this discussion, um, just as kind of a opening statement or opening set of just things that you're, you're thinking through in this moment. Um, I think that'd be great just to kind of ground us before we get into the questions. Sure. Kick off. All right. Well, um, again, thank you. And I just kind of want to uplift the work that you've been doing. And that's, this is it. Like, for me, I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist, I, I teach, so I spend a lot of time thinking about what sustains us and what sustains life and what sustains us in moments of, of real upheaval. And I get a lot of folks reaching out to me about like, how do I continue? How do I keep the keep my energy up? How, how am I able to continue showing up for Palestinians and in solidarity when this is, you know, gnawing at me and eating me up inside? And so I, I think, you know, having you make these sorts of interventions, and I cannot uh, highlight this enough to our comrades on the ground in Palestine, these sorts of things make a difference. Us being in community makes a difference. Reality testing in the face of unbelievable disavowal, denial, uh, psyops, I know we're going to talk a little bit about that. These sorts of spaces are really important. They're not just sort of like side gigs. And so I I, I think that's my overall framing and just gratitude to folks like you that show up and are exhausted. I know, <laughs> I know you are and they're long days. And also it pales in com comparison to what folks on the ground are going through. And, and it really does overall when we can say we're all showing up and we're here and this is part of a larger movement. This is a, this is a moment of convergence for us. Uh, what's happening in Gaza, the genocide, and and across Palestine, um, and and that's the, our moment of convergence. But it's also something larger and something we're building and something we're sort of working towards. So I, I'm that's the space I'm in right now. Wow. Well, I really appreciate that uh, for sure. Um, Stephen, is there anything you wanted to say? If, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, thank you again, and I, I agree with Laura. And, you know, we have a lot of friends who reach out and I just always want to say number one first of all is that um that yeah you know, just being in relation to one another um uh, means something and it's the way we feed one another and the way we nourish our souls the way we build our communities and getting tired is natural because that's what the machine does mm -hmm. um 
But with that said, I just wanted to really, there's a few things I've been thinking about, but I'll just say one in particular, what happened today, and, and I know it's in the news cycle and most people have heard of it, where Biden basically said that he didn't believe the Palestinian yeah, yeah, yeah. count. The health authority, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he said, I'm sure innocents have been killed. And so they talked about the believing stuff, right? Um, but he says, I'm sure innocents have been killed, but it's a price of uh, it's a price of waging war. And I just want to say that a lot of people are going to talk about Biden as a genocide denier. A lot of people are going to say that, oh, basically, the United States is standing by or even sort of, you know, facilitating, um, giving political cover and um, giving the armaments to a regime that's going to and is committing genocide. But I just want to say two things to help us switch our perspective. And that is, number one, that that statement is a statement of war. And the United States is, a, number one, a perpetrator of genocide. We know this from its inception, of course, sure. but I'm particularly talking about this very moment yeah. in, in Palestine. It is, it is an active perpetrator. It is actively perpetrating um, a genocide. And um, there are actually boots on the ground, American boots on the ground have been reported that have been shooting. Delta Force, et cetera. Um, so I just want to put on everyone's map that this is about Palestine. This is about Palestinian liberation. But the Palestinian, Palestinian liberation struggle is going to become the next Vietnam War movement because the United States, it's very likely, is going into war and is not stopping. And this, and, and, and and a, a, a phrase like it's a price of waging war is a dog whistle to telling us that we as Americans are going to war. And the only reason Israel has not invaded is because no one has faith in the Israeli infantry because everyone knows that they're clowns that can only kill people, kill innocent kids at checkpoints and do night raids and those sorts of things. Um, we know that everyone's waiting for literally the cavalry against the indigenous people once again to show up mm -hmm. and genocide uh, another indigenous population. So I just think I just want to put that on everyone's map that we're going to shift from pro-Palestine Solidarity Act to a mass anti-war uh, mobilizing. I appreciate that framing up front. I really do. And um, yeah, I, I had something I wanted to say, but I can't think of it right now. But I do want to just say hello to some people in the chat as we go through. There's a lot of good people in here. Um, so just want to welcome folks as you're coming in. A couple of silly housekeeping YouTube things that I forgot to say up front uh, that I will say, even though I hate saying them, is like like the video share it with folks, subscribe to the channel, all of those things to help the work that we're trying to do here and to help get this conversation to more people as well, which is important. Um, anyways, oh, it'll come back to me. Um, so anyways, I know that you both, as, as you mentioned, you you know, you said us referring to the United I know you're from the United States. I know you're not in the States right now. Um, and, uh, you know, are in the Middle East currently. Um, everyone has seen like videos of massive rallies in countries like Yemen and Jordan and Lebanon and Egypt um, and elsewhere in the region, often with, you know, the masses demanding that uh, either their states in a lot of cases or also non-state forces, uh, you know, get involved in support for Palestinians. Um, and uh, there's there's there have been bigger rallies and more actions here in the United States too, than I have seen, you know, I mean, I'm not been in the Palestinian solidarity movement as long as you two have, I know, but even just in my, you know, 
whatever, six, seven years, like being more involved in that, um, certainly bigger than anything that I've seen, um, you know, and, and, uh, but in other countries around Israel, like, you know, you, you see people like really pushing up against the borders, really like, you know, kind of trying to do whatever they can in, you know, seeming direct support. And so that's a really interesting context. I think this is what I wanted to say before, Stephen, based off of your comments, too, is like, you know, Fred Moten said something yesterday that like we can't you know, he was talking about putting the whole weight of certain things on certain people. And he was like, you know, we can't put the full weight of what anti-colonial struggle is onto the Palestinians, right? Mm -hmm. That means that we all have to take this up as well, if we're mm -hmm. serious about it as well, you know, and that can be look all kinds of different ways, wherever you are and whatever you do. But, um, you know, I think that's a really important thing, too, because it it, it is true that we're we're facing, you know, potential genocide here. I mean, not, I don't mean potential in terms of like, I don't know whether it's a genocide or not. I mean, potential in terms of whether they will be successful or how successful they will be. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to give you space to kind of talk about your reflection on the vibe outside of the United States to the extent that you could mm -hmm. talk about that. Sure. Sure. Um, I'm going to start and then I'm going to pass it to Middle East expert here, <laughs> but I think I'm, I'm going to speak as a Lebanese person. Both of us are Lebanese, have been part of the Palestinian struggle for liberation for a very long time, each of us in different journeys. But I think one of the things that's really important for us is this, uh, that one of the things that powers do, including our states, our respective states, whether it's Egypt or, uh, or Lebanon or any of the states that are involved, or Morocco, or any one of these states, is that part of their machinery of dislodging solidarity is planting amnesia about how long solidarity struggles go in terms of people. And I, again, this is where I want to say Lebanese and Palestinians, because I'm speaking now as a Lebanese person who comes from a long line of folks who are, we're in solidarity with Palestinians. And I think there's this sort of rewriting of history as though somehow Lebanese oppose Palestinians, right? But we know that all along liberation fights have been pan-Arab. And I think what we're seeing here once again, and maybe this does look different to a Western audience where they're like, oh, wow, there's all these like people in the streets from Yemen to Iraq to all of that, to, to uh, Lebanon. But for us, we're just like, yeah, of course, because our corrupt leaders, right, have a class solidarity with Western powers, and they don't represent the people, especially folks who are normalizing, right, these countries, these Arab countries that are normalizing. And I think what people in the street are showing everybody is these fools might be normalizing and making you all think that this is what it looks like on the street. But we, the people of these countries, have always known, right, what solidarity looks like. Our fights have always been linked up. As Lebanese, we were also occupied by the settler colonial state of Israel, right? So. We still are, right? Uh, Syria is also, parts of Syria are also still occupied. These, these fights have always been that. And I think one of the things we have to be careful about, especially when we're consuming this sort of narrative, in, in the West, is that this idea of uh, of cutting up history in certain ways, like starting history on October 7th, like saying, oh, wow, there's so many people are in the street, is precisely the machinery of power, right? That every time it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a surprise for us. For us folks here, it's not a surprise, mm -hmm. right? The Palestinian struggle and the liberation of all Arabs runs through Jerusalem. Middle East expert. <laughs> yeah, right on. No, I think it's just like, you know, what was she saying? I think, you know, being in the Arab world, you know, you know, there's a lot of cynicism that we get a lot of times and you hear people sometimes in the Arab world and sometimes outside, you know, that, you know, the dominoes are falling, you know, 
Sudan or you know Morocco and Emirates and Bahrain and you like you know so there's a feeling sometimes people are going like you know oh whatever you know and the Palestinian Authority is horrible I mean the Palestinians they're just a bunch of puppets you know so like mm-hmm. what do you have but th- this moment it as uh, Lara says is kind of I don't want to say it rekindled it, because it does it hasn't died it just is that it's that connector that allows that electrical current to drive through all of us as Arab. And not only Arab, I think there's a different thing about actually happening now than it happened like, let's say 30 years ago or 40 years ago, is that Arab nationalism did do a disservice, for example, in Algeria, Buflika, whatever, or Boumedin's, you know, policy towards Amazigs or something like this, is that there's a unity in the Arab world among all people here, Arabs, Amazigh, Kurdish, you know, Armenian, across religions, and liberals, you know, who you would think, should, you know, usually are sort of nationals and talking about national interests. We're all galvanized. We're all galvanized. So there is something, and to some degree, you know, there was, a, you know, I think there's a sense that There's a sense that they know that this is, they know that Israel and the United States want this to be the final countdown. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They know it. We know it. They, they, we know it. And this is, by the way, the American playbook. They try to do this in Iraq to try to have a war, a massive cataclysmic war. And Joe Biden was one of the people who was a proponent of dividing Iraq up into three different states they love partition they love their partitioning Mm -hmm. right and that's what they wanted to do and it didn't happen and i think there's a sense there's a sense of these borders again we can hold on to our national identities without being nationalists right there's a moment that we are at we as lebanese we as moroccans we as as you know algerians we as you know jordanians as iraqis we can see ourselves in Palestine and fight for our siblings there mm-hmm. and know that this is, we know that these borders, we are connected not only culturally, but through a historical process that our crappy leaders that we have now all form an arc, a similar arc right. that we are subjected to. And so there's this mass movement. And even those crappy leaders like Sisi, if are forced to come out and in some weird ways advocate mm-hmm. for the Palestinians, advocate for a ceasefire right. um, and reject, by the way, this is, uh, you know, hearsay, maybe I've heard it from, from some sources that, you know, Blinken was out there in the first couple of weeks and they're still trying to work for a mass population transfer out of Gaza, a mass population transfer. And that he went to Egypt, U- UAE, Jordan and Saudi Arabia to ask for them to accept two, three, four hundred thousand Palestinians each to evacuate. You think they're go- uh, Gaza? Do you think those Gazans are going to be let back in? It's that's what I mean by the perpetrator. They're, they're perpetrators. So, the, but the the yeah. Arabs, Arab populations feel this and are mobilizing. Yes. yes, and they're marching with living memory. Yeah, like Iraqis, it's living memory. This is not long ago. Yemenis. Right. And this is something that's also written out. I mean, Yemen is barely covered in terms of what's happening. So folks in the street are not just or this is an abstract, you know, far off. Oh, this is some some, you know, nationalist movement we're making. It's sort of like we are living, breathing memories of what the machinery of empire does. Right. And people are not standing for it anymore. Yeah. These are the these are the grandchildren of the people who marched for for and great grandchildren of the people who marched for liberation mm-hmm. in, in anti-colonial mm-hmm. struggles. And, and, and Fred had this great line about how we need to constantly be reimagining and recommitting to our, uh, anti- our own anti-colonial, uh, anti-colonial struggle. And that's what this is. You know, again, talk about the generations and the our ancestors. I mean, right. these, the, the people feel it and they know it. And it's from their grand, grand their grandparents and great grandparents to them that they're in the street. Yeah, brings to mind that Fanonian quote about uh, each generation must uh, 
In relative opacity. Yes. Uh, discover its mission and then fulfill or betray it. Something along those lines. Yes. yes. Um, all right. Uh, so I do want to, you know, Lara, I know you're, you're a psychoanalyst, and I know that the book that you both wrote together is about psychoanalysis under occupation. And there's some stuff that I think we can definitely talk about through a kind of psychoanalytic lens, through also, you know, you're, you're both Fanonian in your work, right? And so um, there's been a lot of interesting and I think some dubious invocations of Fanon in, in, during these times. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, was mentioned um, Laura, Laura, when we were talking about doing this was you said, Hey, I want to talk about psyops. And I was like, Oh, great. Um, and so Hanif Abdurraqib, you know, we had him on a couple days ago and he, you know, he had this really great reflection on like just how many people he's talked to that are just like, I feel like I'm, you know, taking crazy pills right now or whatever, just based off of like the, I mean, I was talking to an organ, a student organizer last night and like the strong disconnect between like what you can see with your own eyes if you log on to social media, uh, especially if you follow Palestinians or you know know where to look for for news coming out of Gaza or Palestine, uh, versus like what our political classes and media are showing, right? And so it's like this stark contrast. Um, and then also, obviously, like the comment you talked about from Biden, there's been numerous ones from from him. Um, you know, from Blinken, obviously, we're now also getting a lot of uh, commentary from Israeli uh, officials, which I don't think usually in the West, we usually see as much of that as we do in these moments. And of course, they're just like, yeah, human animals, everything else, right. And so, um, I, yeah, I don't know ex exactly what you wanted to talk about in terms of psyops. But I would love for one, you just to tell people I mean, that's a term that gets thrown around some, especially if you're on the left, but people may or may not have a good understanding of what a PSYOP is. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just interested in things in terms of, you know, aspects of this struggle that you're thinking about through the lens of PSYOPs and, you know, whatever else you wanted to bring in through that idea. Sure, absolutely. Um, let me let me lead with like a tongue in cheek sort of thing. I'd like a moratorium on Fanon and Battle of Algiers at this point for folks and, and you all know who you are. Everybody who's made a career off of Fanon and off of Battle of Algiers that has not said one word or suddenly all of a sudden doesn't understand what that means. I respectfully ask that we stop using Fanon, right? And and disrespectfully. yes, disrespectfully <laughs> asked. But it, you know, again, that's that's tongue in cheek, but it's actually not because that is part of the psyops, because that is what makes people feel crazy, right? Because we we're coming off of let's say the last, it's been longer than this, but let's say the last five years where we have seen people co-opt words like decolonization and what does this mean? And and again, we see people on whether it's on Instagram or or career decolonizers, let's say, um, right? And that is part of the psyops where now people are like, these are people that I've learned from and felt like they actually generated knowledge and they're nowhere to be seen or worse than that, there's all of a sudden a backing away from everything they've ever said because it actually only lives in the abstract and has become an academic exercise for them. It's a theoretical exercise, which is incredibly harmful. I think that's part of the gaslighting when people say gaslighting, right? Is that they're feeling like, what was this actually all about? Is this what it is, right? Or does it stay in the realm of metaphor? Of course, we know Tuck and Yang's, you know, seminal piece about decolonization is not a metaphor. When I'm talking about PSYOPs, so PSYOPs are psychological operations, right? Is that there are ways in which war, especially, right, uses psychological operations to invade the province and the sovereignty of the mind. Why? Because I think, you know, war can be what we're seeing right now and dropping bombs, but war also has to work on the level of the psychological, the psychic, first of all, to conscript people, but also to invite people to identify with certain sides, right? And so what we saw, especially in the first part of this new saga, in settler colonial aggression, and I'm using settler colonial both in terms of the United States and 
the state now known as Israel, right? Um, is that PSYOPs became one of the most important ways to really make people feel like they were crazy, that they were entirely alone. I mean, abusers make the people that they abuse feel like they're entirely alone and no one gives a fuck about them, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what I mean about PSYOPs and why it's important for us to pay attention to the affective coercion that is used, right? The PSYOPs is not necessarily just the misinformation. That is one part of it. But it's really to live in a world where you start to think and believe that really the entire world believes this. When you see CNN being, might as well be Israeli propaganda news, right? News channel. You start to sort of live in this world where you're just like, this is what the entire world believes. That is successful PSYOPs, right? Where we start to internalize this belief that we are fringe, that really this is just a small section of the world that's that believes this, that I must be. And then we get in this sort of space where our starting point is always a compromise. Our starting point is accepting the structure and the framework that settler colonial states or capitalists or empire sets for us. And that's our entry point, right? And I think this is targeted. It's on purpose because what ends up happening is people start to recognize, right? People, and I'm seeing people in power also start to recognize that refusals are actually incredibly important. Refusing, refusing the hegemonic narrative, refusing mm -hmm. to reality then, refusing the, the, even the framework that we are being given. Those are really important tools against PSYOPs. And we're starting to see this across the news, especially when you have folks Palestinian folks on news channels that are sort of entering the like as though they're being entering the fray, right? Having to qualify as a precondition their position, their humanity to even enter the conversation, right? That is what I mean by psyops. And this has been, I, I don't think people were ready for the level of pushback. I don't think the United States right. government was ready for this number of people in the streets. And what I want to say as a response to PSYOPs is, folks, there's no way we'd have this many people in the streets if the organizing wasn't happening outside this moment of crisis. Just like what we saw after the murder of George Floyd, where people seize moments to mobilize the movements that have already been organized, right? Right. And I think that is the that is also when we see psyops ratchet up. So this level of like we will look at it and it looks like this is what disavow is. It looks like disavow. It looks like it's ridiculous. So I'll give you an example. I just saw um, actually a shout out to a patient of mine who sent me a article that said that on the sand along the San Diego border. Authorities were warning that Hezbollah and Hamas fighters could be coming across the Mexico border into California. Right, right. Okay. We are, it's easy for us to be like, that's ridiculous and just say, and just move along. But it's not ridiculous, right? Why? Because it's not, we're not dealing in the realm of reason here. When we're talking about psyops, we're talking about what is it that we are activating affectively that finds traction because the United States has also been organizing as we've been organizing in, in, to push up against these sorts of mechanisms of control and surveillance and, and racism and, and oppression and repression. Power also organizes. And once you sort of start to um, elevate annihilation anxiety, fear, of course, this gets linked up. And this is why Palestine is a solidarity movement across the board, because we're also then talking about immigrants and we're talking about the fear of people coming across borders. And then we're activating subliminal messaging around borders and the need to protect borders. And when there are borders, the violence to protect them is necessary, right? That is the sort of arc of PSYOPs that we're seeing. And, and what I'll say one more thing is, if you feel like you're going crazy, and I'm, I'm not saying this in a sadistic way, I'm saying this as a way to say you are in connection to reality. 
we should be feeling like this is crazy making. None of this should make sense. This should be incomprehensible to our mind. All of us should be changed by this. Every single one of us should at once recognize the mechanisms of, of psychological um, in, 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 intrusion that is happening and in our resistance and refusal, recognize that this is part of what is used and be changed by it forever, right? So folks, hang on to your madness <laughs> because that's also, I, I, and this is where we can also bring in disability justice because folks who are disabled and madness studies have told us for a long time that this idea of pathologizing madness under conditions of oppression, right? That we should be symptomatic. It should be hard for us to go to sleep. It should be hard for us to watch these gruesome, right? Videos and, and photos. This is sh what we should be feeling. Now, our, our communities of care is also what helps sustain us, right? And helps us also be able to lend ourselves in places where folks are need to tap out for a second. But mm -hmm. don't shy away from the crazy making. That means you're actually not, <laughs> right? Right. And if I could just make a, make a Marxist intervention on this one as well. I mean, there's, a difference, <laughs> <laughs> there's a difference between psyops, which are these sort of event, let's say episodic event in, uh, interventions by power, right? Let's saying, you know, little sort of letting out things like watch your southern border, which at large did a brilliant you know, reading of. And the contradictions in the imperialist racial capitalist world that we live in. Mm -hmm. And when people say, this is making me crazy, it doesn't add up. It's because you're not allowing yourself to metabolize the contradiction. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we're still the minority in some regard because it's all over, you know, uh, you know, CNN and you can talk to your crazy uncle, you know, Jack and your crazy aunt Jane, right? And they can they'll say all about how, and, but that's the whole point is, is that, those contradictions, this disequilibrium that one feels is because they recognize the reality bending mm -hmm. that imperialism in, establishes mm -hmm. systemically, mm -hmm. right? And of course, the disequilibrium also could be seen as the threshold to consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we want mm -hmm. to see the ideological apparatus of this country you know, United States as an imperial power and a settler colony like its little mini me, Israel. Mm -hmm. So, and I think the, the, the fact that we're shocked is that still like we always, even leftists, we're like, we still believe, we still believe that maybe Arabs should be, um, how do they say it in English? Cal uh, yeah, so we'll Calculate. They are seen. They're they're calculated. They're 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 held as as humans with the same rights as everybody else. But they're not. We know this. They're saying this explicitly now, mm -hmm. and they can say that explicitly because they're working on on an ideological level where they are. They're happy to ameliorate those contradictions, right? Mm -hmm. And I just want to say to end up with is the psyops on the other hand will work on those people. On, on on all of us who eat Mac, you know Big Macs and drink Coca Cola and salute the American you know baseball bat right? Who's us? You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but psyops don't work a lot of times on the people that's supposed to be because when you throw leaflets, you know when Israel bombs leaflets into you know into into Gaza saying that your people are, you know, Gaza, you know, these people are your enemies or whatever, and they're betraying you. And look at, uh, you know, look at the Hamas leaders. They're swimming, you know, in beaches in Tahiti and all these sorts of things. You know, people, they know this is nonsense because mm -hmm. they have clarity. Mm -hmm. Because when you live under oppression and you understand who the oppressor is, you have clarity, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something that Fanon tells us. Yeah, that specific genre of PSYOP is just really creepy. 
Like <laughs> I just look at that stuff and I'm like, like, oh, like I think one of the interesting things in this moment is, I don't know. I mean, I just feel like stuff like that is making the rounds more on social media. Like the, the comedian who was, or whatever, the TikTok person who was like, you know, playing with drinking water and like squirting his water hose and stuff like that. Like, you know, oh. it's like some of this stuff, like it just like it actually ends up in a certain way, I think backfiring to <laughs> to people yeah. of like good conscience in the world because they're like, that is unhinged. Like, yes. what are you doing? You know? Yeah. Um, yes. And so, yeah, yes. there's, there's like, yeah. I think I saw one thing it was like a it was like a YouTube ad basically that was like being targeted to like Palestinians that was like, yeah, like telling them that their children can't read this, but like, you don't care about your kids or some, some wild thing. And I was just right. like, this is right. This is right. Yeah. And that's what we're left with, right? Like the, right now, what we're left with is the fascist discourse that is actually at the heart of all of this, right? Because part of what we, you know, at the beginning, and I think this is what Palestinians have been saying for a very long time is that the veneer, the guys, right? is useful in terms of science because it it invites people it conscripts people into identifying and misidentifying who's oppressing who does the oppressing but what we're left with right now is these like you're saying unhinged versions where again we're seeing this sort of like uh, even i was watching nadine kaswani with pierce morgan who's more than happy to get clicks by the way he's he's having the ride of his life when he finally started actually inviting people who who people respect like Loki or Nadine to, to, to speak and actually have something to say, right? But part of what happens in there is in the same breath that he's trying to ask for some, trying under the guise of innocence to say, this is a question I would ask any human being. The person sitting next to her is a Nakba denier <laughs> who made no qualms about saying, it's Jewish folks who were ethnically cleansed in 1948, not Palestinians. Right. And there's no such thing as a Nakba. So this is what we are left with right now. And I want folks to really pay attention. It feels so demoralizing sometimes. And sometimes we watch these really horrific. Right. Whether it's violent, like these influencers that you're talking about or these violent narratives, like people saying Gaza is not really an open air prison. You've just been fooled into it. this is what we're left with. And that can be extremely demoralizing to think are there actual people in the world that still believe this. And also that is everything has been scratched and we're left with fascism right? We're left with the supremacist ideals that undergird settler colonialism. And if we're talking about Fanon, that type of truth telling is actually really important because that is what makes, like you're saying, your regular person go, whoa, wait a second, this is what I'm signing up for. And if they still defend and stand behind it, well, we're clear. We're, we're clear. clear right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was great. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, I want to talk about something really difficult here. So, like, um, there, you know, one of the early live streams that Electronic Intifada did, and huge shout out to the work that they always do and are doing in this moment. Um, yes. They're still doing live streams at least every couple days. So make sure you're you're checking those out. Um, they do incredible work on those, as, and check out their website and everything else. But um, and I hope I don't mispronounce his name too bad, but it was uh, Rifat Alari or something, something close to that. Um, but he's a correspondent in Gaza. Uh, has you know, um, he's also, I believe, an English professor as well, or uh, or poetry teacher. Um, but uh, in this interview, you know, he shared that, and this was. I just want to remind folks, this is on day three, right? Of we're now in day nineteen, I think, but of um the siege you know of of the response um to alox of flood to operation alox of flood um that he talked about struggling to talk to his children and like you know not wanting to sort of hug them too hard or weird because he felt like that would make them more afraid than they already were obviously children in gaza are unfortunately, like very used to bombs being dropped, very used to airstrikes. This is not an unusual thing, although the level that it's at right now is certainly, you know, unprecedented or at least 
I don't know if it's unprecedented totally, but it's it's at a at a huge level, right? Um, and uh, you know, so like he didn't want to let his kids know how scared he was, right? Um, and you know, days later, a woman from Gaza, and I apologize, I didn't get her, you know, her name or, but she had shared on Twitter that she had actually contemplated taking her children's lives so that they would not have to bear witness to the continued horrors that are going around on around them. And again, these are still like, even that one was probably like 10 days ago or so, or, you know, and so like, um, you know, I know like, and I'm apologize to everybody. I, I should have trigger warning before I went into all of that, but um, Laura, like, Laura, you're a professor of clinical psychology and a practitioner as well. And I know you both wrote this book and, um, you know, your work really focuses a lot on the kind of quotidian violence that Palestinians are under, um, you know, the checkpoints, all of the daily humiliations, um, so much more. But, um, you know, this is not the every day that we're dealing with right now. These are really, you know, egregious times. Um, and uh, I just, I don't know how, and I don't know, you know, I, I feel it's inadequate to even ask this kind of question, but like, how do we, how do we even try to conceptualize the, the level of psychological violence that's going on uh, for Palestinians right now? Yes. And, and Gaza, I guess, in particular, but for Palestine as a whole as well. Yeah, thank you for, for asking that question. And I think, you know, obviously we've seen that mental health has been a real big issue. There's been a big push over the last several years, especially to include that in these conversations. What, what I'll say is this, is that, it, it, you know, this is in the book, and I know that you know this because we've spoken before. I'm, I'm a big critic of the trauma industry and the trauma field because it over-focuses on point-in-time trauma, right? The one point-in-time trauma. And what Palestinians, of course, and Palestinian clinicians have always told us is there is no post when you're talking about structural issues, when you're under settler colonialism, there is no post, just like there's no post to racism in the United States or indigenous genocide and the effects of that. There is no post. So, but I wanna say one thing, and this is why I am really a critic, is that here's your point in time trauma, folks. This is it. All your theories are based on these catastrophes that happen and then you theorize about intergenerational trauma 50 or 100 years later, right? This is your point in time. And what have we seen from people? We've seen an, an actual support of genocide. Psychologists saying it is justified to cut off water, fuel, food from people. We are seeing intergenerational trauma that is to come mm -hmm. happening in real time right now when we talk about entire families being wiped out we are talking about entire lines of people folks entire lines of people being wiped out we hear stories from the ground of folks separating children sending children with their uh, with their uncles or aunts so that if those families die one of them survives mm -hmm. that the line can continue that's what we're talking about right now so i don't want to hear any more people theorizing about trauma unless we are seeing what is the point after the fact Folks on the ground and Palestinians have been telling us about how this slow grind of trauma is of sed from settler colonialism, 75 years and counting. One of the things we do in our book is uplift that people continue to make life under conditions of oppression, right? Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. see the monumental suffering of people in Gaza right now and, and the pockets of life when they're helping each other when they're sharing water, when they're sharing food, when they're rationing it together, when they're digging out children with their bare hands, right? That does not mean they are superhuman and will not feel traumatized, right? Right, right. And I think that's the piece for all of us 
But really, when 50 or 100 years from now, this is yet another genocide we talk about as being baked in to the genetic fiber of people buried in their psychic space, passed along, unspoken or spoken, that's what we're seeing right now. And that's why we all have to sear this into our mind. That's what I mean by we should all be changed by this. And we should all be changed by this, not because I'm a sadist saying we should all, be, but because we owe this to the people of Gaza who we have failed. We have failed them. We've helped create the conditions that this trauma can happen. Whether it's through the tax dollars of the United States or being silent or equivocating or thinking there are two sides when there's a nuclear power or any one of the things. Right now, this is our commitment to the people of Palestine, to Gaza, to say that this moment, if we see it as a trauma generationally happening, that we are also committed to disrupting that going forward and to building a world where those conditions no longer exist. I, 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 can't, I can't think of being an ethical clinician if we're, if we're not doing that. Yeah. Maybe we should take a moment there. And um, I know that we can probably add this stuff to the show description and stuff. But if there's any, I know that you work with organizations that, that do this work in this context. Um, and I don't know if there's any folks you want to uplift. Also, I just want to note in the chat earlier, we had somebody, let me hang on. Sorry. The chat has a, there's a, there's a lot of chatting going on. So which, that's a good thing. People are enjoying <laughs> this. Um, but uh, here we go. Um, Love and solidarity from Ireland, Palestine mental health network. Um, those are the, those are the folks. <laughs> those are the folks. Okay. That's, yeah. That's so, a... so yeah. I mean, any any folks that you would just want to highlight for people to be aware of. I know that, um, you know, I can I can add it to the description afterwards if folks, um, you know, I know there's people that take donations and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah, um, Palestine Global Mental Health Network. Uh, which we sort of we talk about in the book, of course, but they do incredible work because they speak across a unified Palestine in defiance of borders that would make them non-contiguous, right? And they're they're saying no, actually, we are unified in speaking about the mental health of our people and in providing them services and and in also getting the word out to people outside of Palestine to ask for what they need, right? And folks, I'd say if folks in Palestine, across Palestine, this is not just a, right, to those of you who think this is just a Gaza thing, right? And I'm saying that it, it pejoratively when people, <laughs> I am saying that it's a pejorative thing. You should be ashamed of yourself when you say that. This is a, a, a cross historic Palestine coalition that really are our compass around what is it that people are needing. They do call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. They call for, for conferences not to be held because it is fundamentally opposed to the ethics of clinical work. And if we are truly invested in the mental well-being of people, we should not be supporting a settler apartheid state, right? Uh, you In the United States, there's, there's a USA mental health uh, Palestine Mental Health Network that do incredible work in the context of the United States. In the UK, there's another one. In I believe in Belgium, there's one. Our, our Irish uh, colleagues are are here. So there are folks across the board. Of course, Jewish Voice for Peace um, Healthcare Advisory Council also do incredible work. And uh, the Red Clinic in the UK, we did a solidarity event with them and we're doing supervision with our colleagues in Palestine. Um, many of whom have been uh, dropped by their Israeli supervisors um, and folks who are or might be uh, afraid to talk to their Israeli supervisors. They're treating Palestinians in Arabic, um, which we talk about in the book. Yeah. Remind folks. Yeah. So we talk about this in our other discussion, yes. but that part about Israeli supervision of Palestinian mental health, just just 
for people, I'm sure a lot of people in the chat are not, you know, watching this are not aware of that context. So could you just quickly contextualize that for folks too? Of course. And if anybody in the border, in what is now known as the 1948 borders, right? And also folks in Jerusalem, um, if they want to be licensed by the settler state, they have to go through training that is uh, supervised by Israeli supervisors. And so we have Palestinian clinicians who are seeing Palestinian patients in Arabic, but have to back translate to their supervisors and supervision is necessary to get licensed. And once people get licensed, they also have a licensing board that grants them their licensure, all of whom are Jewish Israelis as well. Right. So this is what we mean by these sort of systems themselves, training, being embedded in settler colonial structures. Right. It's not like Palestinians living within those borders can opt out of it. Then what, what's that? So we often hear, oh, well, then don't become a psychologist. Well, is that an option when when there is an entire population that needs services? Right. Or they're the only ones who speak Arabic. And so that's what I'm talking about, is that we're seeing right now a lot of folks um, not be able to speak about their experience out of fear of retaliation. And this is what, you know, uh, systemic power means. It means that you have the ability to allow people to continue in their career, to succeed, to get licenses. Uh, you dictate the discourse that's happening in the therapeutic space, regardless of what patients are saying. Um, you get to abuse your power, for example, by saying things like, um, you know, I'm seeing I am seeing everybody in black and white now and we're the good guys and you're the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Right. These are things that Israeli supervisors are actually saying. Okay? And so this was to sort of go back around about the, the uh, uh, many of us uh, in collaboration with the Red Clinic in the UK are also trying to do support groups for folks on the ground and also offer uh, spaces for people. Very much appreciated. A uh, couple of comments. Uh, you know, I think this is an important one. Um, uh, there's another question I'll bring up a little bit later that is, is a good question. Um, but yeah, and we talked about that a little bit in our conversation too. I mean, I know, Laura, you also do work with folks in the United States to try to, um, you know, recognize that a lot of psychology, maybe we should say something about that too, like the, the coloniality, the settler coloniality that is built into um, mm -hmm. so much of psycho psychology and psychiatry and that your work is really looking at a, a different orientation towards psychoanalysis and psychology um, that is an anti-colonial or decolonial one. I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that aspect. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, it's it's in a long history, right? It's not new. And I think, again, this goes back to the idea of like amnesia, right? Is that part of what settler colonial empire does is sort of make us forget that these movements have been happening for a long time. And so one of the things I think I'm I'm not alone. There are many of my colleagues and comrades that are just we are no longer OK with a the system of psychology as it is trying to excise the social and the political from people's clinical process. I mean, it, it and we feel it is unethical for clinicians to sit in rooms with people and locate their struggle and their symptoms in their own individual failures when we live in a world that is falling apart around us, when people can work three and four jobs and still not be able to feed their families. How is it that we can ethically say your psychological problems are really just because you're not coping well, <laughs> right? right? And I think this, but, but people say that. <laughs> so, right. um, and really insist on that. So, so what I'm doing is, you know, again, in a long line of folks and comrades and colleagues, whether they're in South Africa or India or Palestine or Lebanon or uh, all over the Middle East and in South America who have done it before me, right? And they're, they're, it's, a, it's in keeping with liberation psychology and it's in keeping with decolonial psychology. And so there's not by surprise, there's a lot of amazing work being done in the global South who never forgot Fanon. 
um, and folks in the United States who we, you know, as leftists, we might consider of the global South. It's not by chance that these are the folks that are leading the way and that this is a feminist and decolonial intervention as well. And if I could just add one thing, it, it, as Laura was talking and, and the question you asked kind of remind me of also of kind of what Walter Rodney would say about like Marxism in the global South, right? And that is to say, you know, like, I don't think, you know, nowhere in the book and nowhere in our work, no one, Laura's work is, you know, do we say, you know, um, you know, psychoanalysis is just, you know, mm -hmm. hugabaloo and we need to throw it out and there, we have to only go back to indigenous forms of, you know, psychology or something like that, which is like, I'm not, not shade on that either, but it's just to say that, you know, I think what uh, our work does together and, and, and Laura's practice uh, in particular, for example, um, might do and, and her and her activism in the field might do also is to think about psychoanalysis as you know the a way that something that has that had emerged in a particular place and time right and for, with freud um but its full potentiality you know sort of realizes itself always in the moment of its use in the hands of the people who are you know, who need it, uh, not in the hands of the people who use it to police. So, you know, there's a conference in, uh, in our uh, uh, association that is, is a yearly conference and the theme is for next year, sex. And it's Freud and, you know, it's, it's you know, psychoanalysis and half her field is, you know, losing their mind um, because the potentiality that is being put forth um, is disruptive to them because, you know, they kind of act more about in terms of sort of policing desire than, than thinking about the ways in which systems and, you know, social systems and political systems kind of worked upon the, the, the psyche. Right. Um, right. so I just kind of yeah. wanted to kind of clarify, you know, so like we're not demonizing psychoanalysis, we're not elevating it, you know, it's just like, like Marxism, you, it, you use it as a way of thinking but in the hands, as, as Rodney says, kind of in the hands of the global South, it kind of seems to realize it's sort of the full potential because it, it, it's that sort of capitalism that was exported. And then, uh, you know, it's sort of in a sort of brutal face, you know, um, showed itself more in the colonial in the colonial or colonized world. So. Yeah. Well, part of the reason why they're losing their mind, and this does tie into Palestine, by the way, Part of the reason is because they don't recognize this psychoanalysis because the theme is sex, right? But what our incredible organizers and their team, uh, their committee members have linked it up with is the ways in which psychoanalysis has been used to, like you said, police not only gender and sex and subject formation and how settler colonialism is involved in the making of, of sex and gender in particular ways and criminalization of sex work. And that is what we're talking about. And that is what there are more and more people saying, this is the conversation we need to be having. This is the conversation we need to be having because this is, this is the conversation that is relevant to people's lives. Right. And that has always sort of been relevant to people's lives, not a white supremacist, whitewashed, sterilized psychoanalysis that only belongs in the clinic and one that is a top down sort of colonizing force. Right on. I appreciate all of that. So I do want to talk about resistance, you know, and resistance in this moment. Resistance is really important in your work. Um, and, uh, you know, in the book, you kind of and, you know, I have apologies on some level because I read this, you know, we it was probably, I guess, yeah, 20 months ago or something like that when we did our first interview. And so not all of it is totally top of mind. And because I'm doing so many of these conversations, I didn't go back and, and pull exact like quotes or citations. But I remember in it the theme of how important resistance, that the resistance is in some ways like sort of the only response or the only maybe not the only, but like, is the is a response that has the ability to make, you know, like, to, I'll let you explain it better. But 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 the but the it's very important, basically, to the mental health of Palestinians is 
resistance, right? Uh, and, you know, obviously we could think about this through the context of Fanon as well, you know, and Wretched of the Earth and other work. Um, and, you know, there's a way that even on the left, a lot of times in our conversations, that the Palestinian resistance gets kind of erased um, from these discussions. Um, it's it's inconvenient for folks to maybe have to parse through how people feel about it. They're not so sure. Um, it becomes only about Palestinian trauma often, about the, the war crimes and the genocide. And I want to be clear, those are very important things for people to focus on because there are also places where we can potentially intervene, whether that's, you know, taking direct action, whether that's, you know, organizing, whether it's, you know, boycotting companies, et cetera. However, however people can think through, there's a lot of ways that people think through how do we resist mm -hmm. the war machine? And we can look back at examples of history of ways people have done that in, you know, the United States and the UK and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. I think that's an important part of it as well. But it is also important that there is this... Um, yeah, so I just talk about resistance and, you know, I know you've talked, you you know, you have conversations with a lot of Palestinians. I, you know, I know there'll probably be some things you're comfortable sharing, some that you're not, and that's okay. But in general, at least, what are some of the themes that, that you feel are important to share from those discussions mm -hmm. or from, from your own point of view? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um. Yeah, thanks. It's a, I mean, it's a great question. It's a, it's a big question. You know, I think uh, when you're talking, what came to mind was um, a therapist who appears in the book who says, you know, resistance keeps us sane. You know, and I I remember also, you know, stories. I was just talking to Laura about this the other day. I remember stories from the Lebanese Civil War and friends telling me that, like, their, their best... Uh, the most, the most sane, solid people that they knew were people who worked in the Lebanese Red Cross who drove ambulances into places that had just been blown up by car bombs and stuff like this and dragging the, and there's an element of like, I think what happens is, is that systems of violence in general atomize us. And of course, what Zionism wants to do is atomize Palestinians. I don't think Israel has a problem always with like, you know, there is their Arab citizen one person at a time, right? Oh, I like my Arab neighbor. Muhammad is a good Arab, right? But <laughs> collectively, they don't like them very much, right? Um, mm -hmm. And of course, there are no Gazan individuals. They're just one collective. So what we've noticed is, you know, everyone's sad, everyone's hurt, everyone's hurting. And, and we're not even going to talk about like how, um, the conditions in Gaza are unspeakable. You were asking about how to talk to your kids about that or whatever. I mean, how do you talk about, you know, the, you know, how do you talk about living in a horrific traumatic situation? You know, I mean, Holocaust studies has talked about this for years, right? Like how do you represent the unrepresentable? So let alone to your a child. So, but, you know, I realized, so everyone is like really broken and really sad. Um, so the question becomes like, how do you hold sadness and despair with hope? And how do you make anger and indignation into a, something generative? And I think what we have been doing and talking to, you know, Lara's a clinician, me as a non-clinician is, talking to everybody and talking to our people and talking and being there for them. And I think community helps. And that's, I mean, how do you conceptualize resistance? I think this is the problem. People think I'm not doing anything. Like if nothing else, like today, now, yeah, even, even on Instagram, you're doing something, you're generating data, you know, you're generating data that's, that's moving certain things, right? You're, you're making meta admit that they, you know, fudge the bucket on purpose to change things, you know, to suppress Palestinian content, to elevate Israeli content, you know, in the street, we know that those people moved the needle and made CNN even represent some horrifying things that are happening in Gaza. 
So I think resistance looks like a lot of different ways, right? For us on the outside, it means organizing and resistance keeps you sane, right? The more and more I hear from people is that we're sad, we're broken, whatever. But when you're in community, when you're organizing, when you're doing things, when you're sharing your pain and sharing your hopes and sharing your, 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 your joy and actually also working to elevate Palestinian liberation, that is actually a form of serious therapy. You know, that's, I think that's, we can't underscore this enough. And then, of course, in terms of resistance in Palestine, of course, you know, everyone, you know, Palestinians aren't allowed resistance. They're not allowed BDS, which is a peaceful. They're not allowed to do the Great March, which was peaceful. You know, they're not allowed to wear a kufiya or a flag in Germany. Like, how dare you, Germany? How dare you? They're just trying to cover their tracks. The last thing they want to see is a Palestinian flag. Why? Because that reminds them of their freaking crimes, mm -hmm. right? And if they have to, if, if they have to, if they realize that Israel is a genocidal state, that means, uh oh, they they knew that, you know, that, that means their, their reparations weren't good enough, you know? Mm. So the thing is, like, everything that we do disrupts. But in our disrupting, and there's also community, there's also, and there's also some, but that's not to, you know, so in that sense, resistance is important, but also we have to, we also have to face something very, very brutal or very, very, doesn't sound good. Biden's allowed to say 7,000 dead Palestinians, 2,000 under the rubble that are missing is the price of war. And we know this would be more. But Palestinians aren't allowed to be happy that they broke out of jail. That's not the price. That's not the price of liberation. Right. Right. Yeah. right. And I, I think we've all sort of, I think this is a place where we have to contend. And I'm glad you said leftists, right? Like we have to contend with uh, what this means. And like to also um, rid ourselves of the romantic notion of what uprisings look like, mm. right? Because we we often, again, when I say you talk about Fanon and people love to read on violence, or when you when you watch Battle of Algiers, or when you dream about right, or you need to talk about Che, and it's like we've seen a lot of Palestinians or a lot of folks being like, "What did you think we were talking about?" Like the conditions that created this are violent. What did you imagine? would happen, right? And and I think what's worse is that when we are not troubling this, like you're saying, when we are not contending with what resistance can mean, because that's not the only way, like Stephen was saying, but when we're not really taking that seriously, we are giving a death sentence to people under oppression. This is effectively, let's be honest about that. At least be honest about that. Because you want folks in Gaza to just sit in a cage and die slow deaths because it feels easier for you than to contend with the question of what this actually means in our current modern age. Now, I want to say something that wasn't a problem when Ukraine came around. Right. Overnight, and we've seen all these memes, right? Molotov cocktails for Ukrainians, that's fine, right? And so we also have to, as we contend with this, we have to contend with what underwrite the unconscious racist, Islamophobic rhetoric that underwrites our hesitation around these conversations, even conversations. No one's saying come out and but even to have these conversations, it's like that is untouchable because of what's what underwrites it because of these Islamophobic notions. But I want to uplift what Palestinians have been saying. I'm sure all of us have seen this in one form or another. Is if you have solidarity with our corpses, but not our resistance, that's not solidarity. What do you imagine keeps people from becoming corpses? Mm -hmm. And I want also just the imagery for me, how things, of course, here I'm, I'm reaching to and Duty Roy around portals, right? Mm -hmm. And it is upon us to, to sort of really wrestle with how horrifying liberation can be. These, 
These are horrifying things and they have been throughout history. And so if you're telling yourself a story of every liberation movement, of every time somebody freed themselves from power, if you're telling yourself a story that that was, you know, bubbles and unicorns, even internally, there's, you need to reckon with that, right? Mm -hmm. And that is what we have to, the, the, the level of what we're, con- it is important for us to really be horrified by what that actually means. And I think that is what Fanon was trying to tell us is like, these things are horrific. None yeah. of us want to have to see this, live this, watch lives being lost, right? Yeah. None of us. And, and also there are lives being lost. And that if and if that same horrifying impulse is not there on a daily, what is the types of violence that you are okay with on the daily? Right? Then we're not having an honest conversation. Because resistance is about the will to live. Yeah. It's about the will to live regardless. I wanted to say something because some folks in the chat were probably a part of our Fanon study group, and I just want to credit them for you know, everything that they made that experience. And, you know, one of the things that several of us reflected on through that reading, uh, you know, together collectively was, you know, there's all these people who say like Fanon's an advocate of violence or Fanon's a, you know, it's like, you're not reading him correctly. Like he's, he's, he thinks it's terrible. And yet he understands that it's a tragic necessity of the colonial system that like, how else are people supposed to free themselves of violence, you know? Uh, and, you know, yeah, it would be wonderful if it could all be done, uh, you know, nonviolently and so on. Maybe in some contexts that works better than others. It, it's not, but like, you know, you talked to, we had decolonized Palestine on, you know, last week and, you know, Rowan and Fatih are just like, look, we've tried all of that. You know, we've tried, we've been told to find the Palestinian Gandhi for forever. And we've tried every Gandhian uh, approach to this and it doesn't work. This is not, this is not something that the settler colonial state of Israel is, is going to accept as, you know, a a viable, you know, they'll shoot us, you know, Max Isle also, he talked about how, Nonviolence is very violent. It's just one-sided violence. It's just subjecting yourself to violence, thinking that it will change something. And in some contexts, that might be the case, but that it is it relies upon the people you're subjecting yourself to the violence at their at their hands. It relies on them to be able to actually change, and that has not happened. You know, and so exactly, and it's never received as nonviolent. Nonviolent acts are never received as nonviolent because nonviolent acts also disrupt power, right? If you're putting billions of dollars into criminalizing BDS, you're seeing it as, in fact, that's what it's stated. It's a violent thing. Mm -hmm. So even our framing around what constitutes violence and not, like, it's not like, oh, people stand there or MLK was sort of marching and people were just like, what a lovely man he was. Right. Right. (laughs) How wonderful or Gandhi or thank God he's nonviolent. All the rhetoric is the exact same. And because it's the structure that's violent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I want to talk a little bit too about, uh, about settlers right now, about uh, the, you know, we've kind of gotten to this a little bit, I think it's some of the earlier discussions. Um, But I, I do think that this is a really, uh, you know, we, when you talked earlier about sort of like all that's left is the fascism, like the the psyche of the settler right now, it, it feels like so f- sort of fragile and flailing. And I realize like I'm I'm making an abstraction as I'm doing this. Right. Because like I can't get into the psyche of every single person that, you know, whatever. But uh, I'm really thinking about, you know, folks within. Um, the Israeli regime that are saying all of these genocidal things just on, you know, CNN or, you know, and and BBC and the way that our news reporters in the West will just sort of nod and smile as they say something that, you know, shouldn't even be allowed to be spoken in public. 
Um, but also, I mean, like Biden, you know, is, is another great example of this. And I think that, you know, there's this interesting thing about um, obviously the relationship of states like Canada, the United States, Australia, you know, these these settler colonial um, parts of the West in particular, obviously the UK also in that it seeded all of these settler colonies all over the world, too. Um, but uh so there's kind of a, a settler internationalism in a certain way, you know, and, and there's a and there's a, a psychological mm -hmm. thing going on with that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, Fred Moten the other day, you know, in, in addition to the thing that we talked about, um, you know, he, he talked actually about and this goes to his intervention around uh, Jewish people in Israel. And I think it's really beautiful the way that he lays this out, you know, which is just to say that like the idea of Israel, you know, he, he sort of likened it to, he said, this is a quote, no people should be married, made to carry that weight. It's an unsustainable weight. It's a weight that requires the people, requires people to literally, as it were, constitute something of a dam against the motion of history. So he was really talking there about the 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 excising the historical excising of jewish people from europe from the united states into israel and expecting them to form this settler colony that is this line of defense quote unquote right even though it's obviously he also talked about we're always defending ourselves and that there's that's why there's a department of defense instead of a department of war and and things like that you know and so uh yeah, I, I, you know, I, I just was interested in, um, you know, this, this notion of, you know, how flagrant and out in the open it is. And, and I think you and I had talked a little bit, Lara, about, you know, this is a symptom of decline. You know, I, I'm just interested in what either of you think about kind of, kind mm -hmm. of that, um, and maybe imperial decline and some, yeah. Wow. I'll, I'll just make a brief. I, it's a, it's that's a big one. It's a complicated one. I think it's. I don't. Um, first, I would never speak for the Jewish experience. Um, no, I, I love Fred's um, comment, which I heard again. Also, like all of us, with uh, his talk with uh, Robin Kelly, and then he repeated last night that is, you know, Israel is an artifact of uh, of genocide, you know, of the Holocaust. Which is really it's just a brilliant tragic realization and fred if you're listening run with that do something with it because it's gorgeous i would love to hear more about it and you know i think obviously you know teaming up with anti-zionist israelis to write something about that would be pretty beautiful mm -hmm. and I, I so i never speak to jewish experience because I, I i would never be so presumptuous um nor do lara or i ever psychopathologize Israelis as Israelis. We don't psychopathologize the Israeli state. This is important to state because we've been misrepresented as such, both of us, um, when we say that the state has psycho psychotic functioning, it acts psychotically, right? Um, I don't know personally, I mean, this is from coming from an Arab, right? Um, and also from someone who wrote a book about Islamophobia where that's Western tradition is to psychopathologize. An entire people. <laughs> Peoples, mm -hmm. right? So we really don't do that. Um, I like your the way you're pointing us to the sort of the fraternity of settler colonial colonial sort of you know it's like fraternity too like it's like mafia too you know they're, they're related right in some ways right um but it just brings us to the idea of you know i think sociogeny which is what fanon talks about so what do you have in these states that you know they build structures they build social structures and how do those social structures eventually saturate our own psyches right um and i just want to kind of go backwards just a little bit about the fanon thing about violence and how it's really misread 
and all respect to Adam Schatz, whose work is wonderful, usually, you know, all respect, but the, I, the last piece that he wrote on pathologies, sort of pathologizing the Hamas as, you know, the, the pathology, basically saying that so, it was so, as abused people, they, they lashed out. And um, that's not what Fanon says. Fanon says that the violence of the colonizer is so great. It is that through social journey, it is Im embodied in us. And our reaction is to lash out, to become visceral. But what consciousness does and what the anti-colonial movement and struggle does, it gives us clarity so it doesn't become a nihilistic, murderous rampage, right? So I think this is, it's the other side with the settler colonial psyche, if you want to call it, right? I mean, I don't, it's just that what you have when you have hegemony. What sort of psyche do you create when you have hegemony? And you have a psyche where whatever you say is true. That's why white nationalists spread fake news so easily, because they speak it, therefore it's true. Right? And as we get, and if you talk about decline, I think perhaps, you know, the Israeli state can no, because of globalization, all these other sort of historical things, labor, that valence of labor Israel, labor Zionists is gone. And the true core, the true ideological core of it as a settler state exists. And so what we're hearing is a sociogenic discourse hmm. of settler colonialism, which to the to the non to the ear that lives in other places sounds nuts, right? Because you're not allowed to say things like these people are animals, all of them, all of them, all of them. You know, they're cockroaches. You know, we're not, not, people aren't supposed to be saying this en masse. It's just like the one crazy a-hole who like, you know, you might know in your life and that somehow should try to get away from them always, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this is what we want to think about, like what's happening with these people. I don't know, and I can't speak to, I mean, we don't look, we look at them and then we think they're nutcases, but I don't think they are. I think this is the problem. When we think about these settler colonial states, what are the social structures? What are the social structures that, undergird these settler colonial states, including the United States and Canada. Absolutely. That that makes this language normal, normative, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, right. And I think if, if nothing else, I think part of what you're saying is that to the valence piece is I think for the first time we're, we're seeing that, you know, we're always, we're always accused, you know, anti-Zionists are accused of exclusivizing the state of Israel. And actually what we're saying is no, this is a settler colony like other settler colonies. And, and for finally, you know, I think more folks are seeing that this type of language is actually normative to the logic of settler colonialism, right? Because it's not just about dehumanizing, when you are trying, as Patrick Wolf teaches us, when the native is trying to become the indigenous, the logics of elimination also include sort of mechanisms that make that more possible. So it's not just dehumanization, it's also saying every single <coughs> every single person in all of Palestine, by the way, which is why it's such bad faith when we just focus on Hamas, when people tell people, do you, do you condemn Hamas? This is such bad faith because we know the settlers are being armed. We know that people all across, all across Palestine are being kidnapped, are being targeted, are being assassinated. This is not just in Gaza, folks, right? So if Hamas were really the issue, why are you going all across Palestine and doing this? And of course, no coverage around that. So I think what's what those are the sort of mechanisms of control that I'm talking about. And Israel can no longer get away with the, the sort of edifice of being a democracy, right? It is an ethno-nationalist apartheid state, but it's also a settler colony. But I, this is where I want to go. And these statements, we can be like, holy crap, because maybe, like you said, we're not used to this getting airtime, even though mm -hmm. this has been the discourse since the founding of the state of Israel. You just look at the founding fathers and what they wrote to each other about this. It, there's a straight line between that. 
right? Exactly. Or, or that gold in my ear, right? Like these, these things are not new, but I want to sort of bring it back to the connection of settler colonial states, because this looks like it's exclusive. But if we look at the structure of settler colonial states, we can see that maybe just a month ago, for example, in the settler colony of Canada, there were disappeared indigenous women in ditches and they were not allowed to go in and find those bodies, right? In New Zealand, in Australia, they're not ratifying the rights of indigenous people, of aboriginal peoples. So this sort of violent rhetoric that just is like normative to these settler colonies happen all the time. And that is why these internationalists, if there's internationalist fascism, there should be, we have an international solidarity struggle as well that sees these logics repeat itself. And the shock is because perhaps people have been spared of this, but we understand it in Arabic. We've been hearing this our entire life about how it's talked about. And it is important to say, we hear this all the time in the settler colony of the United States, in the settler colony of Canada, in the settler colony of New Zealand and of, of Australia. And that's our place to be, is like to, to hit the points of that this follows a familiar logic. And that again, moves us back to Fanon because that's what he gives us, the logics of racism, the logics of, of, of colonialism. And I just want to give a shout out on a recognition of Northern Cyprus, Northern Ireland. That's right. Western Sahara. And all the settler colonies that never that are, remain uh, that remain and never given any spotlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right on. And you know, even though there's a uh, you know some degree of formal decolonization, um, obviously there's multiple settler uh, colonies that were established in Africa as well. You know, um, and so you know, and those legacies, there are still settlers that are there, right? Even if uh, maybe the politics around it have changed a little bit. Um, so. Um, so I'm bringing a couple of audience questions before I let you go. We finished with what I have, and I do want to let you go soon because I know it's got to be very late there, um, but I appreciate you. Um, so one question I thought was a, a good question to bring up, which is um, just how do we trust ourself and mental health to those um, people or um, mental health industry? Uh, they get, get influence over and control. And I think... Uh, I think Ng is a uh, is a new African. I could be wrong. Feel free to correct me in the chat if I'm incorrect on that. Um, but yeah, that just sharing that context because you know the colonial uh, aspect of it as well. Context. I I'm I'm going to oversimplify this, but I mean this. You don't trust them with your mental health, <laughs> right? And I'm saying this because I think that is important. Is that they're endowed with a lot of authority, and therefore that authority needs to have responsibility. And psychologists and mental health professionals have the power to name somebody's psyche. And it is our responsibility to not exploit that and to not harm people. We take an oath to first do no harm and you need to hold people accountable for that. The other piece that I've been, see I've been seeing more and more of this, and I love this, that people are saying, you have the absolute right as a patient or a client, however you wanna to refer to yourself, to ask what your mental health professional's position is on this, to stop letting people get away with feigning neutrality around these sorts of things. Because in some situations, it is a matter of life or death and threat and actual safety. If somebody who is quote unquote treating you is pathologizing your very being, right? So uh, that's why I'm saying it's simplified, but it's true. And I think there is, and I think this is part of what a liberatory sort of decolonial uh, framework is look at is what does it mean to, you know, empower folks with their with taking on their well being and sort of demanding that these theories and these people who are trained to be mental health professionals cash out on their promises of actually attending to mental health and well being. Right on. Um, I wanted to share something with a question as well. Uh, sorry. So this came up. I'm just going to drop a link in the chat to an episode we did with Robbie McVeigh and Bill Rolston um, on Ireland uh, colonialism and the unfinished revolution. And uh, it deals specifically with some of those contradictions. I can't remember how much of that we got into in the discussion, the book, which is excellent. Um, which actually Haymarket has just republished. It was first published in, in Ireland. 
Um, it was a great episode. It was a so, great episode. Oh, thank you. Great, great book, great yeah. episode. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I just say that, like, there are definitely important distinctions between the Irish experience in Ireland and what became, and I say this as an Irish American, what became of Irish people when we came to the United States and um, did become partners in the settler colonial project here and did become partners in, um, you know, the slave, uh, you know, overseeing of slaves and police forces and all of those kinds of things. And so um, I think that they deal with some of that in that book. And I think probably some of their other work uh, deals with it more because they're very interested in uh, you know, racism, anti-racism, internationalism. Um, and and there are also folks who would say that in Ireland, it's also uneven, that like there are times where um, Irish people have been in pretty solid solidarity with anti-colonial movements, and there are times when they have not been, and um, they fell short in that regard. But um, yeah, there is a very strong connection with a lot of Irish people with the cause of Palestinians. And um, I think that that's... Uh, a strong connection, um, you know, that that goes back a long ways. And I don't know all the ins and outs of that relationship, but it is certainly an important one. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's just for folks who sometimes see like on Twitter, like Irish MPs and stuff like that actually be one of the only European countries that say, well, no, actually, we shouldn't suspend aid, you know, we shouldn't. Um, you know, we shouldn't participate in a, a genocide in, you know, Palestine, et cetera, you know. And so um, that's a that's a reflection of that legacy. Um, yeah, I I don't we don't have any other questions right now in the chat. And I just want to let you go because I know that it is late there. Um, and I really do thank you both for this discussion. Um, much appreciated. Um, shout out to everybody in the chat. Oh, I want to pull this up, too. So yes, Irish living here in Ireland as an Irish person, the colonial experience and global identity heightened and affirms our solidarity with uh, Palestinian people. And I think that that's, yeah, exactly. That's the, the root of that solidarity. Um, and we so, also, yes. I want to say at, at Ireland, like in Palestine, like in the, we also have national bourgeoisies that collaborate with settler colonial regimes and racial capitalism. And so this is how our struggles, and to, to, to answer one of the previous questions as well, is this is how our, our struggles always intersect as right. well. We recognize our struggles as, as, as in each other's struggles, but not only on the level of settler colonialism, but in so many other ways, uh, in, including, you know, we got your eyes on you, national bourgeoisie. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's how you could get Joe Biden being sort of supportive of his Irish heritage in some respect. Oh, why is it doing balloons? I don't know. It does that sometimes. I think it's something if I do a certain hand motion, it does that. Maybe you, said Irish. you said Irish and Joe Biden. Everyone yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but then also be supporting genocide in Palestine, right? right? Um, right. And so, yeah. So right. anyway, um, Laura and Stephen... Thank you so much for this conversation. Appreciate you both. Um, you. Well, folks are here. Yeah, if you didn't subscribe and do all that stuff, please do support us on Patreon if you don't and all of those kind of things. But We are patrons. Um, it's worth it. It's wonderful. And uh, from the revolution. <laughs> exactly. And just keep your solidarity up with our Palestinian siblings. They see everything that you're doing. They see people in the street and it keeps them going. And thank you so much for for platforming that. Jay, really appreciate it. Jay, thank 100%. you for keeping that yeah, momentum up. Exactly. All right. Appreciate you both. Thank you.